know, if you ask people what are the name two symbols of San Francisco, I bet you 90% of people would say the cable cars and the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm. And, you know, um, so I saw the extension, I saw the streetcars as a possible extension of the cable cars. Uh, because by that time, there were only seven or eight cities that were running streetcars in the United States anymore. Um, and so uh, it, was, it was different. It was something you couldn't do anywhere else. That's, mm. And that's why people come to San Francisco in the first place, because it's got a whole bunch of things that you don't see or can't do in most American cities. Well, you know, San Francisco has had a long history of, surprisingly, of underinvesting in in public transit. Um, you know, the the major transit system until World War II, by far the largest one, was called various things. It went into different ownerships, but it's most frequently called Market Street Railway Company. It was called that three different times. Most recently from 1921 to 1944, which a lot of people <coughs> would say was certainly the golden age of streetcars in San Francisco when we had up to 50 streetcar routes and more than a thousand vehicles, streetcar vehicles that um, roamed the city streets. Um, uh, the citizens did pass one significant bond issue in 1947, which led to the conversion a lot of streetcar lines to trolley buses, uh, again, partly driven by the labor costs, partly mm -hmm. driven by the uh, desire of merchants downtown, the Chamber of Commerce, and others to make more room on the streets for automobiles. Yes. And this was a national trend. This was not limited to San Francisco. 1980, the situation was, was fairly sclerotic. It was, it was Muni had had, had a total bus meltdown and ha that they had to import these antique buses from Southern California. Uh, you know, the head of, of the Public Utilities Commission, which then ran Muni, had to issue a public apology. But Muni needed, <laughs> needed some good PR. <laughs> Muni needed something positive. Um, so when they finally opened they opened the, the subway under Market Street in stages, putting streetcars in one line at a time until they had put all five in. And that last migration to remove streetcars from market altogether, from the surface of market, took place in September of 1982. And that's when, uh, you know, and that was within a month, plus or minus, of the time the cable car system was totally shut down for rebuilding. So uh, Mayor Feinstein was paying a lot of attention to the cable car issue because she felt it, well, it rightly that it was uh, iconic and the symbol of San Francisco. We couldn't let it go. Uh, the, you know, I remember when I was an executive at Bechtel, we got hit for uh, a big donation from the mayor and it, it was made it was exacerbated by the fact that uh, Chevron kicked off the campaign. She got Ken Durer, who was then the, not the CEO yet, but he was EBP or something like that. But he coughed up a million dollars, maybe coincidentally, maybe not, two days before they announced their largest quarterly profit ever. Uh, but once he had done that, you know, the mayor, you know, would just go to all these other companies and say, where's my million? The mayor succeeded in raising the money uh, she needed from the private sector. So the cable car thing was taken care of, but they were going to be down for 18 months. And she was flogging <laughs> the engineers and the builders and everybody else to make sure that it was done. Her target was the Democratic Convention of 1984. We're still back in 1982. She's thinking ahead. And at the same time, I noticed that Muni had put out a couple of streetcars, including their old car number one, which they, had, which they had maintained all these years and restored in 1962 for their 50th anniversary. That car still ran. I thought, well, how fabulous that they've got this old car, you know. Mm -hmm. 
And then they, rent, they leased a car, one of their old cars, from the museum up in Solano County, the Western Railway Museum, and they ran these two cars up and down the J-Line uh, on weekends in the fall of 1982 as a farewell to Market Street surface streetcars. My reaction was seeing these old cars rumble by on, on the surface of market, not so fast. You know, wh why do we have to give this up? And so uh, I came up with the idea, I think it was my idea, <laughs> who knows? People tell me it was my idea, but I mean, there was, it grew out of a number of discussions that said, why don't we get the kids together and put on a show. I, I call it the Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland moment, you know, mm -hmm. where, where we said, well, we got these old streetcars, they're running on market now, we'll need some more. But, you know, there was the, enough track was in place to run the kind of roundabout route up to the Castro district. The late John Jacobs, who was the head of the chamber and had been the head of Spur before that, and Diane knew him from Spur, from the chamber. They were on good terms. I was heading the chamber's transportation committee, and I said to John, I said, you know, we could do this one-time summer festival of old streetcars and prove the concept, show that it works. Mm -hmm. And so we went to see Diane, and um, he was encouraged. He, he bought into it. And we made the proposal, and she looked at me, you know, and I pointed out to her that these were the streetcars she rode as a child and things like that. She looked at me and said, I'll do it. But I don't want to see any junk out there. We start this thing up. It has to go to a vote of the Board of Supervisors. The vote is 10 to 1 with Diane behind it. We got the vote. We went and built the thing. There were several people who were really kind of seminal to this. Mm -hmm. um, and the most seminal one was a man named Maurice Claybolt, who was the quintessential San Francisco gadfly and, and someone I think, you know, ranks just a couple of notches below Emperor Norton as a colorful character. Mm. Maurice was a travel agent. Uh, he was a corpulent man, a word you don't hear much, but you know, if you think of Sidney Green Street, mm -hmm. um, but more disheveled, that was, that was Maurice. He, he ran a travel agency. He was a fanatical um, rail fan. Uh, and he also, in those days, did much of the travel, private personal travel arrangements for members of the Board of Supervisors because he gave them deals. This was all in the days before strict <laughs> lobbying laws and other things. Now, Maurice had made San Francisco history in a tiny way in 1979 by uh, arranging for the, quote, donation of a retired, newly retired tram streetcar from Hamburg, Germany. Mm -hmm. He managed to get the money together to, to bring the car over here. Shipping was cheaper than it is now, but I'm sure it wasn't all that cheap. And he either got it donated or something else. He put it on a flatbed truck, and with no warning or notice, he pulled it up in front of City Hall on the day in 1979 when Mayor Feinstein, then pretty new in office, was uh, giving some sort of unrelated presentation on the steps of City Hall, and here comes this rusted red uh, Hamburg tram on a flatbed, and he comes rushing up to her with roses and saying this is a gift to her. It was the kind of thing that, you know, if there's an only in San Francisco kind of thing, mm -hmm. that's an only in San Francisco kind of thing. So Indeed. I knew this guy, I didn't know him, but I knew who he was, and I knew, you know, as several people said to me, you need to get him involved very early on. And I think one person used the old analogy that LBJ had supposedly said about J. Edgar Hoover, I'd rather have him inside the tent facing out, but not facing, <laughs> <laughs> than outside the tent facing in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we formed what, a number of people described to me as the ultimate odd couple, um, almost a Laurel and Hardy physical 
presentation. Mm -hmm. um, but it ended up working out pretty well because he was not going to be reined in. He was going to do what he did. Uh, so he was sort of Mr. Outside and I could be Mr. Inside. And, and you know, I think we both understood what the goal was going to be. So we went around to, around to rail museums. I made a trip to New Orleans to try to pry loose a New Orleans streetcar, you know, one of the streetcars named Desire. I went to rail museums in the East, uh, self-financed, mm -hmm. um, and um, tried to see what we could lease. We ended up leasing a couple streetcars from uh, the museum up in Rio Vista Junction, including the one that had been there the, the month before. We, we, we connected with a guy in Oregon who owned several streetcars from Porto, Portugal, which had been bought and brought over to, uh, in hopes of starting a vintage streetcar line in Portland, mm. which hadn't happened. And we got a streetcar from Australia which was selling surplus cars at the time. And, <clears throat> you know, we repainted a couple, we repainted one of Muni's old PCCs and tried to put Bondo in the dents to make it look better. Some of Muni's cars had come secondhand from St. Louis. So we painted it up in a bright le red and cream livery that St. Louis used and, and that was, you know, something different, you know, and the whole, mm -hmm. whole idea was to have something that looked different. And one of the trams, we cars we, we rented was from from the place up on Rio Vista was a uh, an open top boat tram they called it from Blackpool England made in 1934 very art deco in style you know so mm -hmm. I looked at that car and said I want that car I want I want I want some of those <laughs> because they were immediately so popular people oh, yeah. sitting in the open air and kind of looking around I mean this the whole thing was n about novelty yeah. and we took the cars from wherever we could get them and so we said, well, this is a global collection of historic vehicles because that's what we could find. We had our trolley festival and we had opening day in June of 1983, a few weeks delayed, but uh, and it was five day a week service. It was hugely popular and that got us going. It wasn't long before the mayor was starting to say, I like this, I'd like to do it again next year. And I hadn't bargained on next year. So Muni took care of the maintenance. Um, and, you know, we took care of the administration and the publicity and the other stuff like that. And that model worked fine for the second year too with the chamber involved. But the ch and my recollection is that at the end of the second season, 1984, when the mayor said, let's keep doing it, um, every summer, the light at the end of the tunnel was glowing brighter. Uh, first, I thought it was an oncoming streetcar, but in fact, it was the promise of this permanent line because the support for this was so strong that by the, certainly by the second year, we were already thinking about, okay, how do we make this permanent. 84, okay. 85, I mean, you know, I mean, we, we were certainly dreaming about that, but then the question was, how do you do it? Mm -hmm. There was an organization that had actually, it was a registered California nonprofit. It had been set up in 1977 by a couple of planners who worked for Muni at the time, Peter Strauss and Tom Madoff. And they registered this non, and then they were joined by a lawyer named Steve Tabor, who is still active in the community today. Um, and they registered this, this nonprofit called Market Street Railway Company, taking the name of, you know, this kind of a nod to the old transit company. And so when we got to 1985, Peter said, why don't you use MSR, which was our shorthand for Market Street Railway, why don't you have MSR? Uh, why don't you take MSR from us or turn it into perhaps a membership organization and <laughs> within, by the end of 1985 we had something like 300 members and by the mid of, middle of 1986 it was close to 500 members. So we, 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 we would do little projects like this to kind of keep the momentum going and make the thing permanent. Uh, and we had three more summers 
uh, 70, 85, 86, 87. Uh, and during that period, we moved forward through the planning process for a permanent F lot. We purchased a couple of cars. We purchased one of the cars from Porto, Portugal. We uh, uh, purchased a couple of Melbourne trams. We purchased uh, a tram from Milan or, or got it donated. I think we got it donated. Maurice Claybolt uh, amazingly got a tiny little tram from Russia donated or I saw, you know, through the Soviet embassy. I mean, it was, oh, I don't wow. know how he did it. it uh, that was another Maurice Claybolt special. By the way, he died in 1988, and it was a huge loss. He never got to see the permanent F line. No. No, and it was really a sad thing. We believed that the idea was that it, you inculcate the, the love of this in the city government itself, mm -hmm. the desire, to, or at least the duty to keep it going. The whole idea was to incorporate this, not as a tourist attraction, but as a core part of the transportation system. So that was, that was what we did uh, and spent a whole lot of time selling that, explaining it, getting others to buy into the concept. And, and we succeeded on that. And we know anecdotally, and everybody acknowledges, Jesus, it's, it's popular, everybody rides it. Uh, cars are packed day and night all mm -hmm. hours, you know, et cetera, et cetera, it's great. Or, as Yogi would say, nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded, you know. I mean, the cars are packed, therefore, there must be something wrong. <laughs> they don't <laughs> operate well or something. No, people want to ride these, and so they ride them. And they, you know, they, they stand in line, they wait for a couple of full cars to go by if it's a busy period, so they can get on a car. Which ride, I, ride history to see history. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. We, by, by tying... You know, I'm, I'm a historian first and foremost mm -hmm. in my heart. An amateur one, sure, but amateur in the sense of doing it for love. Yeah. And I love my city, and I love Market Street. History is shaped by people. It's not shaped by buildings or streetcars mm -hmm. or other things like that, mm -hmm. you know. And, and that's what we try to es emphasize. Mm -hmm. So when I found out that Maya Angelou was the first female African-American uh, streetcar platform employees, they call it conductor or motorman, you know, I thought, what a wonderful story. That's, that's a story we need to tell, yeah. you know. Uh, and we told many other stories like that, you know. We dedicated a streetcar to Harvey Milk, not because Harvey Milk was, uh, you know, a, a, an LGBT pioneer, although he certainly was, not solely because he was that. That was still the most important thing, but because he was, you know, transit advocate that I covered as a reporter during his tenure. And I knew Harvey to be a multi-dimensional guy, you know, and, and we, I, I personally did not want to see these other dimensions of Harvey lost to history. It is to try to understand each person in his or her own way. What makes San Francisco unique and appealing to them, and then fight like hell to either preserve it or enhance it, whatever that may be. Uh, we all have our different views of the city. It's, it's so multifaceted. It depends mm. the way you turn it, the way the prisms you view it through, and things like that. But, you know, how can we contribute positively to the future of our town, which is not just stopping change, but harnessing change to be um, an enabler of a better city. I mean, you can, you can hopscotch around sure. town to Telegraph Hill, to Noe Valley, to, you know, even, even the west side of San Francisco now has you know, strong defenders in the Western Neighborhoods Project, you know, celebrating its history. That doesn't mean we shouldn't change, but it means we should take what we have, embrace the past, and harness the past to serve the present and the future. And that's really what I always thought the streetcars were about. You know, it's not enough 
to recreate the past. It has to serve a meaningful purpose for the future. And they do.